Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this year's ATM Virtual. I'm John Strickland, and I'm delighted to be hosting the uh, aviation sessions uh, once more this year, and even more delighted with our, our first guest this year, albeit uh, we're meeting virtually, is Sir Tim Clark, uh, President of Emirates. So, Tim, welcome again to ATM, and the second time around for us to do this uh, in a virtual form. Thank you, John. Yeah, good to be here. Sorry, we're not seeing each other in person. There we are. And hopefully that will come sooner than later. But uh, let's kick off and just reflect on, on the last year. I mean, the last time I spoke to you, uh, which was almost a year ago, this crisis had already hit and we were in a very different place. We didn't know how long it would last or whether there would be vaccines and, and what level of travel we've come to. But uh, give us a, a bit of a, a flavour of the last year. Of course, it's a year of red ink uh, for you and for all airlines. Uh, traffic has stagnated uh, in many cases to zero or minimal levels. Uh, how would you describe the ride, if that's the way to put it, over the last 12 months or so? Well, I think... Um... This time last year, we were we were looking at a pretty stark landscape going forward. We we really couldn't see uh, anything other than the vaccine, the, the the virus eventually going away, probably by October, November, December of last year, on the basis that so many viruses disappear on on, on their own without any intervention, vaccines, etc. But during the course of the summer, it was clear that wasn't going to happen. That this was a pandemic which had a degree of longevity, and of course. That was causing concerns. We hadn't yet actually got into the vaccine uh, production design, got it what you like in the summer of last year, although it was in its embryonic stage, you can use that word. Um, so it was, it was a question of seeing what we could do. And as you know, we activated the, the freighter operation in April of last year, very soon after the, uh, it was clear that passenger demand was going to fall significantly. Uh, and that's been very successful. So when we forecasted the revenue for the company, both passenger and cargo, closing out on March 31st of this year, it was actually about 50% of what we actually achieved. Um, so hats off to everybody who managed to get the cargo operation going, do a lot of passenger aircraft conversions, um, uh, take advantage of the, uh, the, the way cargo demand continued to remain robust, but at a time when airlift was, was going south in a, in a very big way. Now, I'm not, we, we, we didn't get involved in price gouging or anything like that, but the fact of the matter, yields were opposite, both for passenger and cargo. And, and that, of course, allowed us to operate these aircraft above their cash operating trip economic rotation costs. And we were able then to slow the uh, cash drain, which all airlines were facing at that stage, and of course still do. So when I look back, although, as you say, it's been a year of red ink, um, we are a lot further on and much better than we thought we would be at this time. Uh, but I'm not saying that's good, it's just better than we thought we would be uh, in this, when the prognosis we looked at in the spring of last year. And as you said, Tim, about the, the cargo operation, I remember when we spoke last year, at that point, I think you said you got to about uh, two thirds of the 777 fleet operating. And I think now it's, it's a whole fleet, isn't it? Uh, largely performing cargo operations, which is a you know, testament to that aircraft and its uh, capability. Yes, one way or the other, they are all involved in this. So we, we, we activated the passenger operations, of course, as soon as we could, given the constraints that we faced, but cargo was always strong. So don't forget the, the ER will take a 40 ton uh, load in its bellies. Uh, with the AMF positions forward, which is a huge uh, uh, plus for that particular aircraft. It's got great uh, uh, structural capabilities, range, etc. So we were able to, to, to make best use of that. Thank goodness we had those. So Emirates became one of the foremost cargo operators in the world. And then, of course, if you, if you then started filtering the passengers onto them, as limited as they were, um, it all added to the... the, uh, the uh, the the economics of the of the rotation and in terms of the the, the, the other side of the fleet the a380s obviously they were grounded uh lock stock and barrel initially uh, what kind of level of operation have you managed to get back to and is that i guess it's still more sporadic because of the ongoing changes in uh, quarantines and border closures and so on yes it's been very difficult to we've got 115 of those uh, we keep about 15 or 20 flying every week. 
uh, as best we can. Uh, it's not uh, particularly easy given, as you say, the uh, conditionality that we face with regard to access to most of the markets that we're in at the moment. Um, but we are getting them into a strange state of readiness for hopefully when things get better in the summer or the autumn of this year. Uh, so the crews are gradually being returned and uh, the aircraft are being prepared by our engineering groups to, to go into to action as soon as we get the green light. Interesting to see how that uh, develops. We'll come back to uh, the, the A380 as we, uh, as we talk this morning, Tim. Just looking again at the, the, the broader uh, situation, of course, we've seen you know, a, a woeful, but perhaps not an expected lack of coordination around the world with governments. Uh, it seems to me the industry has done its level best, particularly through bodies like uh, ER to, to coordinate and to ask on the other side that uh, politicians do the same. But we have this challenge now of uh, very unilateral approaches about quarantines, about borders, uh, opening and closing. We have a myriad of different tests and different approaches about what is required pre and post flights in different countries and it changes pretty well by the day. Um, how do you see that going forward? Uh, are we going to in any way be able to get politicians to line up more given that by its very nature we're in, it, we're in an industry which crosses borders every day and it has to face these, uh, these difficult uh, uh, backdrop of operating requirements? I think eventually we will get there. The problem we face at the moment is that nobody's really sure of the all the variables that come into this particular problem that we face, whether it be the virus itself, the variants, the, the efficacy of the vaccines, the types of vaccines, the rate of rollout, the rate, the scalability of production, the surge in certain countries that we were seeing in India. This is something that the, the, the politicians of the planet never had to face before. And obviously there's going to be a certain amount of, dare I say, knee-jerk reactions to protect the health of their populations. And the easy one, low hanging fruit for them is to keep foreign, foreigners out. They just add complexity to it. But as we gain ground on this, and it's, you know, you do 10 steps forward, eight back, eventually we will start moving into uh, a, a period of time where the governments of, the, of the, the planet, whether it be through the G7, G20, et cetera, plus other entities lending, uh, informed uh, value to, to the decisions that are made. You've mentioned IATA, you mentioned the World Health Organization, ICAO, in the case of the, uh, in the case of the airline community. There will be, I believe, a consensus that as the vaccines eventually get to the levels that they need to be, not just in the developed world, but also in the developing world, and they clearly need a lot of help, and you see what's happened in India today, everybody has has stepped up and is shipping large amounts of equipment to deal with the Indian problem. So there is a recognition that it is a global problem, that it is not just affecting certain parts of the world and therefore we don't need to bother about it. So I believe during the course of the next few months, the understanding of the protocols that will be needed to drive, in our case, international travel, such as the vaccine acceptability, uh, the perhaps an element of uh, the PCR testing, uh, they've developed the track and trace anyway. That's becoming very much part of the ingrained uh, information that, that governments have on people arriving in their countries. You've also got the um, rapid development in uh, viral therapeutics. So things like remdesivir and other drugs are being developed so they will be able to treat it. So where do we go on this? I believe quite honestly that although it's slowed in the pace that I thought it would be, so I thought by April, May, June, we'd be seeing some relief with regard to the uh, demand for travel, primarily in the latter part of the summer and the winter of this year, that's slowed a little bit for the reasons that we know about. But is that going to change the whole situation? No, it isn't. It's a question of timing. So yeah, we've got difficulties to, to go through. Uh, as the, the, the scientific medical communities, research, medical research, the pharmaceutical producers and all this gradually get on top of this virus, which they will. Make no mistake about it, they will. Um, and, I, and I think probably it's more a question of scaling production, distribution of that, particularly in the developing world where they're, they're hardest hit, 
uh, and getting it to them as equal as uh, on an equitable basis. I've been saying this for a long time uh, because it's the right thing to do. It's a it's a prop, uh, problem that has faced humankind on the planet, nothing like this before that we've had to deal with in our generations. And it needs to be dealt with in a grown up and intelligent manner, bringing all the governments together. Now, until we get there, and because we've got different governments taking different views as to what this means to them, they will take different actions. And as an airline community, particularly in the international uh, travel side of things, that is, as you say, extremely complex for us. A check-in agent who is checking in passengers for Emirates has got to now look at a multitude of different variables determined by country, uh, by transit point and whatever those country requirements are. So it is very difficult. But, you know, this business is driven by a lot of people who are seat of the pants. They are get it done people. And we do work rounds all the time. When I think about the laptop ban that hit us a few years ago after President Trump introduced it, what we had to do to deal with laptops that weren't allowed to be carried on aircraft. And all the other bits and pieces, if you look back in our career, our time in the business, there have been many, and we've become very good at work rounds. So I think, you know, we will get through this. It's just a bit longer than we'd hoped, but there we are. Yeah, and I think, you know, I remember last year, you were optimistic we would get a vaccine. I think I was more cautious just looking at history. We, we hadn't developed vaccines in uh, more than several years of research, and now we have uh, several. Um, another aspect, uh, as you said, in terms of workarounds, it's got to be automation. And again, uh, you're, you're working and the artist working on uh, you know, digital uh, travel passports and so on. It's pretty incredible to me, you know, uh, sitting in the UK, you know, scenes we've seen at Heathrow, for example, recently, enormous queues as you know, paperwork is processed. Yet we have um, uh, automated gates as you do in Dubai. And that has to be the way forward, doesn't it? To, to, to one, not only take away the the stress and the imagery of these big queues, but the practicality when we have um, larger volumes of passengers back again. Yes, I, I think the, the airline community has been one of the leaders in the application employment and information technology way back from the early 60s and when I and 70s when, when I came to the business, they were already automating departure control and reservations and all those kind of things. So is it a walk in the park for the airline community to come up with, with digital application for travel certification, uh, locator forms, etc.? Of course it is, it's quite easy to do. What you have to ensure is that the veracity of the data, one, is, is as it should be, that you upload, and two, the acceptability of that data by the country that is going to receive that data. All these have got to be established, going back to the protocols that I mentioned earlier. The governments have got to accept that the national health data going in travel certification with regard to vaccines or PCRs is acceptable, say, to the Indians and vice versa. Once you've got that, it is quite easy to upload the data, notwithstanding um, uh, privacy concerns, uh, into some kind of digital passport, which covers a lot of other things, not just vaccines, etc and to be able to put those into our rest systems, put those into our departure control systems, transmit them to the arriving point, and a bit like uh, the uh, API data we do today, the uh, countries that are receiving will have all that data well before the passengers arrive and be able to process those on an automated basis. Now we can do that, and as you know, you mentioned IATA. I mean, IATA were very quick to understand simply because they knew that we were a very automated, uh, information technology driven business. Our processes are all automated, they have to be. And so it wasn't difficult for the guys to come together and say, we need to do this. And of course, you can see people like us and others have employed this, we will develop them, and but we've got to get the acceptability as it should be. So to your point about the arrivals at Heathrow taking as long as they, they do, this is not a question so much of of the system itself, it's a question of the veracity of the data within the forms and documentation that is, is built, and they're checking everything. Uh, so there has to be a level of trust, there has to be a level of cohesion amongst governments to accept all of this. Now, if they step back and say, well, let the experts get on with this, 
and we accept that what is good for India is good for UK or China or whatever it may be, then they will deliver something to us which will make life a lot easier for border force who are not equipped in the UK to deal with all of this. After all, after they automated the gates, as you rightly said, the, the, the uh, biometric gates at uh, uh, immigration, say at Heathrow, they um, reduce the human resource. So what you're left with is the human resource that was dealing with the non-digital biometric uh, flows, trying to deal with everything else. So that's a big ask. And as you said, it, it, this has all got to go down the, the path, which will probably be lumpy and longer than we had hoped, but things are happening. In terms of the recovery itself, uh, what, what's your view on that in time scale and uh, and consistency around the globe. I mean, it's kind of accepted um, you know, wisdom, if you like, now, but it's gonna be four or five years. You get the more bullish voices, maybe particularly the low cost segments like Michael Leary, Ryanair, expecting recovery within a year or two. Uh, I'm fascinated, as I'm sure you are, when we've seen, you know, again, maybe it's becoming an overused phrase now, this pent up demand. Uh, we've definitely seen that when flights are offered, uh, people will go. We've seen it a lot on short-haul flights in Europe, for example, you know, Dubai itself, you know, pre-Christmas, we saw Brits couldn't wait to get down to Dubai when there was a chance before it was taken off the agenda. Uh, how would you read that recovery? Again, I, I'm a bit cautious. You know, I, I think it is going to be lumpy and bumpy, and I think some areas are going to be easier than others, and perhaps we'll take two steps forward, one step uh, back in certain cases. Well, the, the ideal situation, the utopian situation, is that the vaccine program beats the virus and in, in its many mutations, and that we are on top of that. Whether we'll get there, I don't know. But let's assume that is the case. And that, say, by the autumn of this year, October, November, December, you get some kind of uh, release, relief from all of that. Uh, demand will, will, will come back at a staggering rate. It'll, it'll, of course, people like Michael O'Leary are going to say the low cost will do well because they probably will. The low cost will benefit from intra-European travel as, as the, that's his speciality, the U US domestic market, the Chinese domestic market, they will, they will grow at pace. Uh, international travel on the basis of that scenario I've just suggested will return in large numbers. Uh, and I, I don't doubt that at all. The problem will be twofold. One is the ability of the airline community to meet the demand when it comes. And two, rolling into the next scenario is what is the conditionality of country with regard to access requirements? And that circles back to the point I was making about travel certification. Um, are our vaccine passports going to be an absolute mandatory requirement to go into, say, Australia um, and vice versa from the UAE? Uh, UK, Germany, or whatever, all that has to be established, as long as that is there, it'll be a natural inhibitor to not to the demand itself, but to the ability to travel. Secondly, if you're going to introduce large elements of cost, then the individual and with his family traveling, uh, facing PCRs or vaccination costs and all the other bit, all the other that the costs are coming in, that's going to inhibit demand as well. We, we've got to find a way that one, we can test quickly on the PCR basis. So I, I mean that you get a, almost like a saliva test or a breath test and you get the results immediately. Secondly, the cost of doing that is virtually nothing. And people are not concerned that when they go abroad, they're not gonna face a lockdown and a red listing or quarantine when they return. So there's a lot of work to be done to free off that pent up demand. So long as those things are there, demand is going to be restrained. And you talk about the United Kingdom where you are at the moment, it is likely given going forward what is happening that a lot of the UK population who want to travel abroad and want a holiday say, will rather do it in the UK. So all your coastal resort towns are now fully booked for the summer because people are hedging their bets really. So it's, um, it's a question of waiting and seeing what actually happens. Things like what's happened in India recently that doesn't help uh, because clearly that, that has, has collapsed the country and has had ripple effect across the global economy, principally by what everybody sees. So that in itself is going to inhibit 
demand, people are going to be a little bit nervous, a bit, a bit worried. Um, the, you know, the airline community, again, uh, I don't want to sort of boast or, or, or sort of blow our own trumpet. The fact of the matter is the airports and the airlines of the world have really, really, really worked hard to sanitize, and I don't just mean in air, well, sanitize how they go about uh, dealing with passengers, so their crews, the protocols, everything else are there. So in terms of concerns about going through an airport or going on an airplane, um, they are, they are, the, 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 the risks are mitigated by all the protocols we've kicked in. But that's not gonna be enough. So it's a question of seeing how we navigate the next six months um, and if we do it right, and I say an equitable rollout, vaccines are scaled, vaccines are distributed, uh, the, 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 the testing regimes are simplified and made it cheaper. All this lends to the theory that by the end of the year, we'll be back in business in some scale, at some scale. Um, but we have to wait and see. Absolutely. And within that, Tim, uh, of course, again, everyone is talking about the different traffic flows. And I've, I've heard you talking yourself recently about the different or rather the different uh, segments of you know, VFR, visiting friends and relations, uh, leisure and business. Uh, we can see already that where, where capacity is available, people who want to visit friends and family, they just get out there, and do it as quick as they can. We know that people want to go on holidays. You know, the, the big question for me is business travel and not just the motive traveling for business, but traveling in those, the posh seats, if you like, the premium seats, uh, either first uh, business or to an extent premium economy. What's your feeling there? Because you know, I, I've, I've wrestled with this in my own mind. I remember my thinking after 9-11, I thought, yes, it's gone for good. And of course it wasn't. Uh, 20 plus years on, I'm going through that same thought process. And now I'm thinking, well, I don't believe we can be precise, but I, I personally believe some will not come back because, you know, just as we're having to do this as a video conference today, some travel can be substituted by that. But I think for me, the intangible element is how many companies will see this as an opportunity to say, we're playing the green card now, we're, we're, we're environmentally friendly, we're not flying our executives as often as we did. Uh, so I, I think there'll be a chunk certainly a minority but a noticeable chunk that won't come back to fill those seats certainly the kind of yields that airlines you know like Emirates and others have uh, have achieved up until the crisis. Well I, it's it's a fair point John I, as you know I, I've never really really subscribed to it yeah uh, often quoted the uh, the uh, mid-90s when the digital age uh, uh, hit the planet mm. uh, and the, the great video conferencing started to take a, a major part in our lives. So much I remember trying to work on the 380 in the uh, early part of the uh, 2000s, trying to get video conferencing capability into the seats of our aircraft. Um, and it was driving a lot of that. But it, I always shared the view, so long as the global economy continued to expand, certainly the pace it was going, that businesses were growing in absolute numbers exponentially. And there were new types of business coming to the market driven by the digital era. We know we could talk at length about that, those kind of things. So the, there was a shift from the huge corporations to multiple SMEs who enriched themselves on the basis of the digital economy. And they had the, the tools, the digital, the automation tools to do what we are doing today. But look what actually happened. We rocketed. The number of people on the, air, air, on the uh, airlines of the world in those particular segments rocketed. Now, what then happened was that there was a view that first class was perhaps not affordable for those, but definitely business class was to be the case. And if you look at what happened in certain airlines, I won't mention them, but close to you, they expanded their business class in large amounts and reduced the economy. And some one of the previous CEOs of that airline, you probably know what I'm talking about, says, I don't want backpackers. I want all the business community and I'm going to make my aeroplanes basically business driven. Now, this was coming at a time when we were moving through into the digital age. The point I'm trying to make is that whether you get to 9-11, 
when you get to 208, 209, look at the data. Look at what actually happened. Do I see that changing? Do I see the global economy going into a tailspin? No, I don't. Do I see the global economy expanding to the level perhaps that it did before? Actually, yes, I do. Driven by the very thing that we're doing. Now, the fact that we're communicating, businesses are communicating as we are doing to Zoom team, etc. that in itself engenders more business. And therefore, whatever you might be thinking of doing, if you're looking for a production base, if you're in that kind of business, or you're a service industry or whatever, in the end, you want to go and have a look and talk and see. You can do a lot as we're doing, probably more than they would have done in the past, but that will cause more people to travel. This is a paradox which flies in the face of some of the scenarios, one of which you've just mentioned. I don't believe that. I believe that the, the you know, I'm not saying that the, the Zoom and team is a bad thing. It's great because over this last year, these platforms have really, really improved mm -hmm. the quality. I mean, think back of how long, 18 months ago, we were all struggling with loots and burdens and losing people and Wi-Fi resilience, et cetera. Now they're really good platforms and there'll be more coming. And they'll be on the, the PDAs far more readily than sitting at a desk like we're doing at the moment. But do I think that's going to change demand for travel in those segments? I think it'll change the type of uh, business that goes into that. There will be new segments created. The traditional ones may take the view and say, well, we'll sit back and we'll do it over Zoom and Teams. But as I think I was reading in the Financial Times today, Polita Clark, who I'm a great fan of, um, she wrote that, you know, the whole business about the interaction of the human, you know, the, the meetings that you have on Zoom and team, and sometimes you can't get a word in edgeways because everybody's trying to speak at the same time. And it's a bit like hold up the spoon, the speaking spoon, if you want to be heard. The actual interaction of people, doing the people thing, which is getting to know, understand the tactile human interaction, which we don't necessarily get on Zoom. These come with conferences, with the MICE business, etc., cetera. Um, and so I, do I see that going south? No, I don't. I'm afraid I do not subscribe to that thinking at all. I think the human is, is as human as he or she was back in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. They want more. They want to go and see. They want to, they want to travel. They want to meet people. They want to experience things. They actually want to see what their production centers look like, how they smell, how they how they work, how you can make a judgment of that rather than by fool, be fooled by somebody who takes you by the nose on Zoom or Team or an iPhone and says, here's my production center. Well, they, will, they won't show you all things if you really want to see. And you don't really get to know people in terms of are these people that you really want to do business with until you have a more 360 degree of that individual or group of individuals that you're doing business with. And that's my view. Now, what will that do to the segmentation? Yes, I have been saying the segments will change. We've talked about VFR. I've often talked about baby boomers who, in the last decade, were excluded from the business class cabin by virtue of price. Uh, it was only when we learned in 2008, 2009, and laterally, and before that in 9-11, that when the corporate segments disappeared, only temporarily, that the price points fell and the cabins were filled up by the very people I've mentioned. What did that do? Well, actually, it gave us a lower income per seat, but the volume took care of the, the delta. So actually, we, we did very well. So the airline community has got to be able to adjust to the changing nature of demand, but not in absolute terms. The demand will return to 4.5 billion people a year, growing at 4 to 7% per annum. It'll be patchy by region, but honestly, I think it'll come back to that level. And one of the biggest single growth areas, again, will be in leisure. Um, and as, as these, uh, all the entities that came to market in the leisure, whether it be the hotel groups, the whatever they may be, city hotels, beach hotels, in the last 20 or 30 years will energize and they will attract more and more people who simply want to get out this pent up demand that you mentioned. It is because people have experienced it before. They know, they like it. Look at the second home ownership, whether it be Thailand, France, uh, Germany, uh, Australia, etc. People bought homes on the belief that this would never end, that the air travel would be there for them permanently. They could jump on a plane from, I don't know, 
Stansted to Bordeaux and go and see their, 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 their house in uh, Bergerac or whatever. Uh, that's a global phenomenon and people are globalized in their thinking, they're globalized in their aspirations and that global approach to the way they are living today will drive demand in the future for international air travel. Interesting to, to hear that, that optimistic outlook too. And I think in addition, uh, you know, we see some cultures, as we know, probably you know, the Gulf region is a good example where people will only travel in a certain class, in a certain style. And I'm wondering as well, the whole question now about social distancing and maybe fears in people's minds, again, a willingness to pay, not for space in the traditional sense of stretching your legs out and having a rest before you arrive or your meeting, but because you want to know you've got that space, a uh, willingness to pay that and linking in with um, your introduction of uh, premium economy, again, people trading up. I mean, I, I know myself on leisure travel now, I would really prefer pre-pandemic to avoid being squashed up in economy on a long haul flight if I could. So I would uh, pay, certainly at least for premium economy if I couldn't stretch to, uh, to business. So I, I think that's uh, an aspect too. I'm also interested, I think it's something that you've started to, to test and I don't know uh, to what extent it's been taken up before the pandemic hit, what, you know, what they call business class light, where you're offering fares, I guess revenue managed, but gave access to a business class cabin and all it has to offer, but I think not the lounge. I think Finnair, I think is another airline I saw doing something similar. And I wonder if that's also another tool and another way forward um, in, in uh, addressing any, any, uh, any change in the structural demand in the next few years. How, how have you found that so far? Has it been, is it an experiment which is still going on to? Yes, I, I think to, 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 to the point I was making earlier about the airlines adapting yeah. to the change in nature of demand, uh, and that's part of it. So in the past, we never had the tools to be able to do that, but to create an a la carte menu for business class travel, which allows you to pick and choose exactly what, and, and the various price points that go with it, I think is a very smart thing to do. Uh, we've seen how it works in low cost, but perhaps that's mm -hmm. been a little bit more controversial. But certainly we have rolled that out. It was working quite, quite quickly. Our back of house systems to deal with that have been developed as we've been going through this year anyway. Um, so we'll be in a position to, to offer not just the four class product, but segments, types of product within those segments. So the versatility, uh, the variety, I should say, of products you'll be able to buy as a result of the work that we're doing and I, I, we're not alone in this, others are doing it. Um, the industry is moving to, in that direction. The, the value proposition of doing that is really quite staggering actually, uh, if you get it right. And the important thing is that, you, that the whole process of, I saw recently that somebody had done that and hadn't told them that they weren't entitled to the lounge at the airport and they, they kicked off and said, you know, I thought this was the price that covered everything. He said, well, actually, no, you're paying 50% less than you would have done normally. So you, there, there's, a, there's a quite education process. But in the end, automation allows us to do all of that, um, even the, in the economy cabin as well. And in terms of also the, the service, particularly in the premium, com uh, premium cabins so that goes with that, do you feel optimistic that that can be restored. I mean, the whole idea now of being on a long haul flight and trying to have a, you know, a, a cordon bleu meal with the, the cabin crew kitted out in PPE or everybody wearing masks isn't really too conducive. Of course, the wonderful experience of the stand-up bar on the A380. Do you, do you believe those kind of elements, which people appreciate, will be able to come back? Or do you think they're they, they going to need different aspects of mod uh, modification, including a need to wear masks more often? Well, Look, Johnny, it goes back to the point that I said this, this will come to an end. Mm -hmm. People have said that the, this particular virus is here forever. It's going to be in the community, a bit like flu viruses. We will overcome whatever that means, whether it be vaccinations, whether it be um, the belief that you will not populate your hospitals and ICUs because you have viral therapeutics. The point I'm making is that in the fullness of time, it will all go away. So that the notion that you have all the things you mentioned, our crew today, clad like Darth Vader, you know, PPE, masks, advisors, inhibiting what we really are good mm -hmm. at doing, that'll go. 
You've got to believe that. Otherwise, if it doesn't, imagine going to the opera, imagine going to a play, being on a train, a bus, or whatever. This will not work. The most important thing to do is crack the problem. And as I said, to the point we were talking about earlier with regard to the speed at which these vaccines came to market, we were driven by the belief then that a vaccine took 10 or 15 years. That was because there were about four minds working on it at one particular time. When you had the global best brains and minds, the, the levels, the numbers that were on it, it was no doubt that this was going to be accelerated. So I have a great belief that the, the, the cracking of this problem and, and others that may come later will be, have been hugely enhanced, accelerated, if you like, by this. So why do I see all this thing going where the football matches, restaurants, hospitality, whatever it is, where people come together, eventually we will be back where we were. And this will be history. And, you know, that may take a couple of years in certain areas, depending on how quickly we get the vaccine rolled out. But in the end, you have to believe that this will be a passing phase and we will restore ourselves to the way we used to be. Okay, it may have conditioned us. It may be people may be a little bit wary and maybe we'll be, be offering the means to control their own space. For instance, you might still give sanitized wipes to wipe your television in the back of the seat or wipe the armrests and things like that. There may be some concerns about that, but frankly, no, I, I, I'm of the belief that it will all come back and, and things will be uh, back to pre-COVID pre times and we will move on. And, and Tim, moving to, to another aspect of the future, looking at the, the network uh, and the shape of the fleet, uh, we touched on the A380 uh, earlier in terms of uh, you know, using a, a modest number. Now you're optimistic about the aircraft. Certainly, uh, my own view is that you are a better place than any airline just by sheer scale to use that aircraft uh, effectively in the future with the Airbus A380 to A380 connections through a, a mature hub. Uh, do you have any sense, or can you, or do you even? maybe I could say waste time doing many scenarios about how many of a total fleet you would envisage getting back at some point, or, or do you just assume you will get back to the full fleet barring any that you stand down for a cannibalization of spares as you've done already? Well, it's, it's yeah, you're right. We are working on multiple scenarios depending on the, con the conditionality of access over time. Um, all of them see the 380s very much playing a large role it is true that we are stepping down three or four of them at the moment um, as they come to the end of their lease lives, etc. cetera. Um, and, uh, but that's where it ends. We still have five on delivery. One's coming next month, one in June, and three probably the back end of next year, of this year or, or sometime next year. And they will remain as a stalwart of our, our fleet for the next 10 or 15 years. Uh, and and I, nothing has changed, John, with regard to the, the, the raison d'etre of that aeroplane, mm -hmm. with regard to access to uh, constrained hubs, um, of which there are many, slot access, etc. And given that the, the uh, 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 airport like Dubai already was a super hub, one of the largest, if not the largest hub in the world, it was providing an unbelievable choice, value, to people who didn't necessarily want to come to Dubai, just wanted to get from A to C over B in a very quick, efficient, uh, hopefully uh, uh, enjoyable manner. Will that change? No, it doesn't. To the point I made earlier, if you believe that things will pick up again at pace once we're through this pandemic, the place for the 380 remains there, as far as I can see. The problem, of course, is that it's no longer being produced. I think ours are the last to be produced. What does the airline community do after that? Because the smallest aircraft then will be the 777-9, which, by the way, is about 130, 140 seats light on a 380. So, the, um, you know, we, we, we believe in scale. We believe that the, the, the whole economics of the hub and its unit costs is incremental, marginal, revenues that we get are, are vitally important. The more we put into it, the lower the costs of the hub, the lower the costs of the operation are. And the economics become extremely 
powerful for us in terms of the income streams and eventually the profit. So yeah, I think the 384 will hopefully be, be here for a long time. And, and you've talked uh, before about um, you know, the uh, you know, other airlines being maybe more averse and have some, some have stood the A380 down completely, but we've, we've heard more optimistic noises just in, in recent weeks from Qantas, they, they believe they'll bring most, if not all of theirs back and British Airways as well. So I think there are other voices around, even if it's a, a select club uh, on this aircraft. Do you believe there are some airports uh, on your network or it could be on your network that could take this aircraft but have not upgraded infrastructure uh, to handle it, but, but where it actually might be worthwhile to do so? I'm thinking maybe any, any markets in Asia where it would still make sense for some airports to receive this aircraft given the kind of constraints uh, on growing demand we're going to see. Well, I, I, you know, all these things are subject to a business case done by the incumbent. I, I can't really say. Mm -hmm which airports in, in Asia would do that. Most of them have adapted anyway. Uh, whether they would spend any more money, the return on investment, of course, is, is, would be diminishing over time simply because the aircraft will go out of service. So it's quite a lot of money to, to accommodate a 380, whether it be the, uh, the, the airfield applications, actually the runway width and the aprons, the taxiway geometry, as well as the terminals themselves. But actually, to the point I was making earlier about the versatility of, of and the, the dexterity of our business, we can handle a 380 off stand. You know, so if you can land a 747-400 on a runway, then we can land a 380. If the turning geometry allows us to make the turn, then we can bust people, we can do all the other bits and pieces, not as slickly as uh, having a gate situation, but we've done that, we do it all the time. Yeah. So it doesn't necessarily cause airports in the world that don't have uh, 380 facilities to spend a lot of money. And again, look, looking um, at the future size and shape of the network, I mean, you'd already begun uh, a lot of work or about the, the shape of the network pre-pandemic, given your, your future orders for typically smaller aircraft, including the 787 and the 350. And you've talked recently about the network actually could be maybe something like, I think you said 25% or more bigger and maybe more destinations. Uh, maybe in certain cases, using some of these smaller aircraft to serve more by frequency. Um, is, that, is that still a work in progress, that kind of evolution? I guess it, ha it has to be. Well, it was, John. It, mm -hmm. it, it was uh, the, the reason that we, we, we bought the 350s mm -hmm. and the 7s was to allow us to open more points, more perhaps um, economically than putting a large ER on there or a 380. But this wasn't about contraction. Mm -hmm. This was about expansion. Uh, this was taking the airline on, given what is going on in Dubai and how minded the government here is to expand the Emirates. We've already had directives given to us as to what the, the place is going to be looking like in 2030, 2040, and how the airline has to step up and meet those requirements, not just us, but of course, Fly Dubai. And so the notion that we would go south was never going to be the case. The problem becomes a little bit more acute in the early 30s when the 380s start to drop away. And bearing in mind that we have slot constraints at DWC, uh, D, uh, DIA, here, and then we have to look at what's going to happen in the airfield in the south of us, uh, Dubai World Central. But it's a high class problem. It's not something that we believe we are going to go south on. Whoever believes that there is going to be contraction in what we do today, think again. The airline will be bigger. Hopefully, after my departure, it will be better than it's ever been. Um, and we'll continue to excel in all the areas that we're going. Importantly, the city in Dubai is going to continue to expand at pace. And it already is. So they are sharing the view that beyond pandemic, things will move on quite quickly. Uh, they already are, actually. And as you, you mentioned, December and January, well, we couldn't believe the number of people that came in. I mean, we, the Israeli market itself brought in 60,000 Israelis in December. There were as much as uh, nearly a quarter of a million Brits here in December. So we know what the city, what its attractions are. If you bolt that onto a hub that's growing at pace and increasing its network reach through multiple additional points, 
both at the second and third level, continent Africa, South America, whatever, therein lies the future of, of, of Emirates and Fly Dubai come to that. And, and it's amazing in some respects for many people who comment on the industry or look at the industry, perhaps some who are even in it, who don't recognize that strength of Dubai traffic, the point-to-point -point market that comes in and out of Dubai, whether it is for business or leisure reasons. It, and that's where you're very different to other hubs in the Gulf that maybe uh, wish to do that, but certainly are not uh, anywhere on the scale that Dubai is. Uh, and looking, as you mentioned, at Fly Dubai, uh, you already were developing a, a stronger, deeper partnership and really looking at how to uh, efficiently deploy your different capacity sizes together. And I, I guess, again, the pandemic has expedited the, the focus on that. Uh, and of course, Fly Dubai is getting its uh, 737 Maxes back into service, offering them not only slightly higher capacity, but longer range. Uh, I think, if I'm not mistaken, I heard you recently say that work will continue, but you know, the, the preference is to certainly very much keep two different airlines for those who think maybe just fuse it all into one. Yes, I, to, to that particular point, the brands will remain mm -hmm. uh, separate, but uh, going forward, the they airlines will operate far more at the hip than they perhaps have done in the past. The rationalization of the network, who goes what where, uh, notwithstanding the, the, uh, the uh, competitive issues that we have to be careful about, but nevertheless, um, I, when we look at what the 737 family can do, and we look at what the ERs can do, the 350s, the 89, 787 9s, and the 777 and the 380. You have an extraordinary, I think I use the word, a number of tools in your toolbox. And that gives you the ability to the point I was making about growing the hub here, of taking your, 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 your city size in terms of the network of the two airlines up to 350, 400 plus. And I don't know many international hubs in the world can get anywhere near that. They may try, but I wonder whether they'll be able to do it. Um, such is the strength of the pull of Dubai, as you mentioned earlier. It isn't just about transit in the hub, although there'll be a lot of that. Dubai is continuing to excel in its, extra in, 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 in its attraction. It has huge gravitational pull. Uh, in the area, and, and uh, I say within the 2,000 mile radius of, of Dubai, but also it's reaching out further. And there is more and more interest in that. So that'll drive what we do. The more you put in points and the more production you put into those points, the more they'll come to the city and also use you as a transit hub to go elsewhere. That's the thinking. You've got to believe that, as I said, you've got to mm -hmm. believe that you can do that. But if you look at what Dubai was in the mid 80s to what it is today, and you look at what Emirates was in the mid 80s to what it is today, therein lies the proof. Mm -hmm. and, and Tim, uh, uh, around that, I mean, the actual whole process we've talked many times before about the planning of networks, I, I find that fascinating at the moment in this year because you know, we've talked before. You know, uh, Emirates uh, development that, you know, the kind of historic data that many airlines rely on. Looking backwards, I always say it's like when you invest in a financial product, the small print tells you the past isn't necessarily a good demonstration of the future. So we've, airlines have relied on this historic booking information from the GDS or flown historic passenger data. And as you've told me before, many markets you've flown to, that data would never have told you they even existed, or you've even found surprises, uh, that flows of development that you couldn't even have imagined. It seems to me, this is really coming to focus for all airlines now. Uh, every airline I talk to is saying, well, we don't know what's happening maybe next week, never mind next season. And all that uh, kind of data, which I must admit, I sometimes have a bit of a downer on, seems to be almost <laughs> in the rubbish bin. But things like the, the digital age allows, like seeing people search and seeing where people are going through GPS information. It looks to me like, well, on the one hand, it's perhaps a, a lot of pressure to be in that process of network planning for those who are doing it. It's actually in some ways much more exciting because we're really discovering stuff in a different way. Do you, do you share that view, Tim? I, absolutely. I, I well said. Um, you talked about Google Search and mm -hmm. uh, the, the amount of work that goes looking at these platforms. Google Search, for instance, Dubai was was at one point in January the most sought after city in Google Search on the whole on the planet. 
Um, so yes, there are. There, there may be um, more people who share my view, which is you take the risk. If you go on empirical data, um, then it, the absence of that will prevent you taking any risk whatsoever. You have to believe that you are capable of creating demand simply by what you're doing, in this case, connecting, I don't know, somewhere in uh, Uzbekistan or Turkmenistan or some of the points in the, the Southern Russian Federation, that if you connect them to Dubai, they will come, but there's no data there because we don't have the, the city players in place anyway. But you can do that. And so the point I was making with regard to the tools in the toolbox, if you've got 737s at the lower end of the capacity range, hugely efficient, in terms of fuel burn and uh, operating costs, if you make a mistake, it's not difficult to withdraw. So he, he, this is part of the, the way we went about our business in the early days. Don't forget, when I came here in 1985, Dubai had 2.4 million people traveling through the airport. And up until the pandemic, it rose to 100 million. Now, if you'd looked in 2.5 and said, uh, 2.4 million in 1985, it's gonna be 100 million, in 2020, they would have consigned me to some other place, probably. <laughs> but the fact that is what happened. And the, the nature of the, the way talking about digital, the digital uh, era, the way businesses change, the way human aspirations change, people are no different. They may, it may be a question of budgets, it may be aspirations, given all the things we're doing at the moment, what they can see whereas they never could in the old days. They can see, they aspire, they would like. And if you offer an affordable product to some of these folks, they will definitely come. Don't ask me at this stage to say what that may be in machining out the four decimal places as I used to do when I was 22 in planning um, on a whim. Don't ask me that. In the end, what you do is you try it and you, you see what happens and you, you send your brand before you, you market it, you do all the bits and pieces that you need to do, but with the strength of airlines like Emirates and also the strength of Dubai itself, it doesn't take much because you know something, they already know about us and they wanna come. So that's the way we will go about all of that. That's not fascinating. Trial, not trial fascinating. and error, but using all the tools that you mentioned, looking at what people do, what they're spending, where, where they, what they can do so far as we can get access to that. Um, that's not always easy, of course, for all the reasons we know. But we know a lot more about uh, incipient demand than we did perhaps 30 years ago. Absolutely. And Tim, the, the vehicles of which you fly, the manufacturers, Boeing and Airbus, you, you've expressed over a long period of time clear views and frustration, in some ways, elements of both manufacturers, but thinking recently of all the, uh, the spotlight that Boeing's been under with the, the Max and painful learnings, they've just announced recently uh, to, to keep their CEO, uh, Dennis Calhoun, in place. Uh, I think initially he was looked at as possibly being transitioned from the previous CEO who, because they fell on his sword over the, the Max situation. Uh, how, how do you read where, where Boeing is going now? Have, have they learned sufficiently uh, the lessons, the very painful lessons uh, of uh, the Max challenge? Well, I think only time will tell. Um, they've had incredible shocks in the last few years, and we know about this. Um, and it, 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 as I've said publicly, I, I think it was, a, it was time for a deep-rooted soul-searching uh, about the culture of the business, about how they went from the shop floor up. So you invert the study. You don't do top down, you do bottom up. Uh, and we learned that actually when the A380 came to market and we had all the problems with the, uh, the aircraft itself in the early years. And it took the shop floor to tell the management how they needed to build that airplane. And that's gone down in the, 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 the legends, the folklore of aircraft manufacturing. And I suggest, all I was suggesting to Boeing is that they do a little bit of this, uh, that they get back to what they were really good at doing, which is producing wonderful aeroplanes, great aeroplanes, which had huge quality control. Boeing, air, Boeing aircraft came out of the Boeing plant, which would meet contract, give you the life that you wanted, were almost trouble free. And I can name many of those. Uh, what happened recently, I say in the last 10 years, 
needs to be looked at and contextualized in the way that they went about their business prior to this and say, ho-hum, now what did we get wrong? Um, and, you know, we cannot continue to operate a, a, a company on the basis of that's a problem, then another problem, then another problem, then another problem. If it was a, a it, you know, if it was a, a B2B environment where you might be able to negotiate your way out of it, when you're talking about airlines in the B2B that carrying millions of passengers rely on the quality of what you do, then you are going to get into trouble with them because they cannot guarantee to their passengers the reliability. I'm not talking about safety. I'm not talking about safety at all. So we've got to have aircraft that are well built, have incredible quality gate into the plant, quality control out of the plant, and propulsion has got to come in and be as good as they say they would be. Now, in the rush to meet cost, environmental pressures, the switch out from the old metallurgical applications to composite and everything else, somehow we got lost. Uh, did we overpromise? Was there an over aspiration? Was there a belief that you could do that? But in the end, not only did they chase that, but they chased cost. And the two were going to be difficult to work together because you cannot come up with new programs as revolutionary as, say, the 787 was, battling the 350 for Airbus, and then uh, try and bring your costs down to almost zero and penalize your product, your, your supply chain. It doesn't work like that. And as I said recently to Boeing, never ever bring a new aircraft out and run in parallel production of the airplane until you have tested and certified 100% that the aircraft is good to go. Then start producing the aircraft. Don't run up hundreds of them and find you've got to make changes to the program. Propulsion doesn't, doesn't do what it said it would do. Uh, your quality issues, you've got all sorts of other bits and pieces. In the pursuit of profit, this is where they make mistakes. So hold on, design, test, build. When you're ready, if the aircraft is as good as you say it will be, don't worry about the profit, it'll come. It'll come because it's essentially a good airplane and people will buy it because of that. So manage your cash flows on that basis. If you need $10 billion to develop an aircraft, to production level entry into service, do it. And when you're ready, start your production process. There is a lag then in cash flow. They've got to manage that. But they've been caught on the 787. They were caught on the MAX. They were caught, and others were caught, Airbus on the 380, the 350 program. All were late, whatever, because they thought they could do better than they could actually achieve. All I'm saying from that is learn from it. Don't make the same mistakes constantly. Um, as you seem to have been doing over the last 10 or 15 years. I say that to both. Um, we have a situation with uh, propulsion on the 787, our friends in Derby. You know, th that, that has been a, a terrible time for the 87 program as it tried to establish itself in the market. Rolls-Royce didn't actually come to the table with a particularly good, reliable engine. Let's be quite honest about it. They've been trying to do their very best to sort it out. I'm sure they will. But here was a situation where people were having to ground the fleet, as we know, prior to the pandemic. All over the world, 87s were grounded because propulsion hadn't stepped up to the mark. Well, you, ca you can't accept that. That is definitely not on. If it was automotive, imagine, you know, JLR in the UK or Mercedes, BMW or, or Hyundai or Nissan doing that, you wouldn't last five minutes. So, it's all about what are we going to do? How are we going to ensure that we never let this kind of thing happen again? What pain do I have to take in this? How, what, what are the primary objectives of the company? You will be called out if you do not uh, do the right thing in the end. So don't let that happen again. And let your shareholders and all the other bits and pieces see what you can do. Because in the end, if you've done the right thing, if you are producing the right products and the sweet spot of performance, then people will buy and they will be rewarded with bonuses and dividends and share value, whatever it is that drives so many corporations. Get the job done, produce a great product, 
And then you don't have to worry about the downstream effects of that because it'll come anyway, because essentially it's a good product. And these days, you can. I mean, maybe that's just a positive thing that Boeing will get that continuity now that uh, Dennis Colhoun has come in there, uh, you could say, to fix this, so to carry on, because it's, it's still a, a work in progress. It, does, could be a it, positive it, thing. it takes a cultural change, it takes mm. a governance change. It, it's got to be, let us work, let's get things sorted out first. Don't worry about what your share value looks like. Don't worry about whether we're going to pay dividends. Don't worry about bonuses. That's the last thing you think about. First of all, let's do the right thing. Let's mm -hmm. get back to what we always did well. And then all the things I've mentioned will come anyway. Fall into place. And out of this, um, the 777X, or in your case, the 7 it's delayed. Uh, and that, again, gives its frustration. Short term, maybe uh, it's a strange twist of uh, fate, but it fits in with what we're experiencing with the crisis. But do you feel it will ultimately come out to be uh, a worthy successor to uh, the triple seven, you know, as we see it today, triple seven to three hundred ER. Well, I, I like to think so, John, because I guess we were responsible for driving Boeing to, mm -hmm. to do it in the first place. Um, look, it, it's it's um, it. There are issues on that aeroplane. I'm not all together clear as to when we're actually going to get them. That's the first problem. Um, we have all the 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 max stigma with regards to certification. <clears throat> and how that may have to be looked at with regard to the work that they've already done. Uh, they already have quite a lot of, I think they have about 11 of our aircraft already built by and large. Um, but this is hopefully if they get it right, and I still haven't seen any data on propulsion, even though it's been in the test program flying, I've seen nothing on what the engine is doing. Um, but when they get that sorted, what I've said to Boeing quite clearly, we will not accept an aeroplane unless it is performing 100% contract for the same reason that they expect us to pay 100% to contract at delivery. So unless it is doing what we said it would, they said it would do and we contracted, we will not take that aeroplane. So we have to see now where we're, where we're going with this. Now, we should have had the first one in June of last year. It looks as though they've said, the back end of 23, well, we always read that for 24. I've been in the business too long. When I hear manufacturers say things like that, they can't give you a figure, they can't give you a date for a tail number, then you know you're shifting to the right, very often up to 18 months. So we don't know what that's gonna do. Uh, it's a real pity, but you know, it's, you, know you said timing may be that the, the aircraft it saved the day by not coming. Well, I'm not altogether sure about that. Yes, it would have given the short-term difficulties, but only short-term. We've got that aeroplane flying in our network pretty quickly. Because we have a load of 777-300 ERs who are due are, are retiring. We had 171 mm -hmm. of them. We've only got 146 now because we've been letting them go. And eventually the 779 was going to inject to replace those ERs, but we, we don't have any visibility of that for three years. So it's very difficult for us. And just uh, one last question on Boeing. I mean, do, do they have the right product range overall? Uh, there's a lot of discussion. Uh, I think they as a company believe, you know, going into the top end of the 737 MAX family, the MAX 10, and then starting on the 787 with the 8, that they've got all, all posts covered. Uh, but there's still this uh, you know, question which comes up uh, in discussion about NMA, you know, and certainly the 757 was a great workhorse aircraft. It still is for those uh, like Iceland Air, for example, still using it. Do, do you think they need to plug that gap with something, or do you think they probably have got it covered with what they have? I mean, it's another challenge, another investment of time and finance that they'd rather not have, but would it pay them back to actually make that difficult call right now? Well, I think um, in the early days when I looked, they showed me what they were thinking about in the MA, MA, as they called it, and what they were trying to do, that particular inventory category, it looked like a good aeroplane to me, quite mm -hmm. honest. Um, at the, the lower end, of course, they got Airbus with the 321 XLR, the top end with a single R, right down to the, uh, what was called the old C-series, the 220. So they have something to compete against with Airbus in terms of that level. Um, 
the uh, so the NMA, my view, is something they would be. I think they are looking at it fairly seriously. But to the point I was making earlier, uh, don't overpromise and uh, get it absolutely sorted out. But yes, in the end, the whole of the 737 line. This was an airplane you and I know came out in 1962, 64, whenever it was. And whatever they do to it, in the end, you have to build an airplane that has the, the qualities of the 7879, okay? And you've got to be able to, that means you've got to go about having a good hard look at what does Michael O'Leary want it for, for uh, uh, Ryanair. What does Fly Dubai need it for? What do other full service airlines look at what it is and then come up with something that deals with the future on that? No, they're probably not minded to do that at the moment. But the 757 and the 767 are going. 767 is taken care of mainly by the 7879, um, but there could be a place, and I think there will be a place for that, in my view, but um, let's get through what they've done, mm -hmm. the problems they've got at the moment first. Because the other side of the coin, I mean, I look, look at Airbus and I'm very conscious the clock is unfortunately beating us and there's a lot of uh, meaty stuff still to talk about. But uh, uh, Airbus, of course, seems to be soaring away with orders and interest. It already had the interest in the 321 NEO and now with the LR and XLR, that seems to resonate with airlines, not least again in this risk averse climate when if airlines are going to recover and put in long haul capacity, they want to do it with not an inefficient aircraft, but you know, more bite-sized capacity. Um, and Boeing's own forecast, which of course they put out, shows single aisle aircraft uh, will be the biggest um, source of demand in the next 20 years anyway. Yeah, I don't, I'm, I don't disagree with that. I haven't been party to their forecasts. And of course, mm -hmm. what you're doing is that, that city pairs that had, had hitherto been connected over a hub, this is the argument about the weakening of the super hubs, would now go point to point. Uh, because these aircraft are very environmentally friendly and cheap to operate. And I, I, I'm sure there'll be a lot of that. Um, and yes, it is likely, given the risk-averse nature of the airline industry today, given the $651 billion, which I think Willie Walsh came up with yesterday, that is now on balance sheets, which has gone from $220 billion to $651, they're unlikely to really entertain hugely expensive wide-bodied aircraft. And to do the job, they'll use these, these, these ones. So yes, uh, I think you're right. The, uh, as I said earlier, the 320 line from the top end to whatever it is, um, is, is will be a, a major growth, growth segment. Of course, if you're traveling at Mach 0.79 and you're crossing the transatlantic and you can't take any cargo because you've got ACTs, your extra auxiliary fuel tanks, and whether you're not going to, you're going to be able to do the full service uh, gizmos and gadgets that you get on airlines like Emirates, on a narrow body giving galley space and toilets and all the other bits and pieces. The monuments then encroach on the revenue earning seat uh, space if you're going to deliver that product. So it's a toss up as to what you do. You may find that the, uh, the, 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 the seat economics go north rather than the south simply because you're trying to do, you're trying to cater for an eight hour mission on an aeroplane like that, whether it be a 737 MAX, uh, eight, or a 321 XLR. So all of that, the manufacturers say, oh, no problem, you only need one toilet, you only need one galley, and they can eat peanuts and sandwiches. Well, it doesn't work like that because there will still be airlines like Emirates will give you the full Monty from A to Z, whichever class of travel you're in. So where does this take us? Yes, if you want to go from, I don't know, uh, Nuremberg to a, a city outside New York, on the periphery, but maybe it would work. But would they rather go to Frankfurt, pick up Lufthansa, and go to New York with all the gizmos and gadgets, um, albeit probably at the same pricing points? Uh, they they may well do that. I don't know. It's anybody's guess. But you know that's a problem that Boeing and Airbus mm -hmm. are going to have to deal with. Tim, I, I've got loads more I'd like to ask you as usual. Um, you, you've probably got appointments you've got to rush off to anyway, and I, 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 my technical colleagues have to go. Uh, so I'm going to have to uh, call this particular conversation to, to a close. Uh, it's been fascinating as ever to speak with you. If I could just ask you one last uh, question, Tim, I mean, we see two things to completely uh, unrelated to wrap in. We see other business models or, or new startups getting going now. Uh, 
with, with lots of optimism to, to seize the opportunity of uh, uh, low price aircraft. You yourself uh, originally expected to have uh, moved moved on to other things uh, to occupy your time other than leading Everest a year ago, but you're still here. I, I can see today still very much uh, engaged in, in everything. Um, how do you see uh, people's chances uh, of starting maybe new and different airlines? And, uh, and do you have any idea how long you're officially going to be uh, in the hot seat? Uh, because I'm sure your, your interest is going to be there, whether you're in the hot seat or not. Well, to, in answering the first question, John, I, I you know, I think it's because I'm an airline guy and have been for so long that uh, startups, new entrants, uh, all I would say to them be absolutely focused know what you are up against. This is not an easy business to, to get into, whether it be the regulators themselves, whether it be the financial barriers, whether it be era political barriers, etc. But if people are minded and focused and know exactly what they're going to do, and importantly how to do it, good luck to them. The more the merrier. Um, and, uh, you know, notwithstanding the environmental constraints, and we've got to think about those very carefully going forward. Um, as to my own position, well, it remains roughly as it was last year. I speak as an enthusiast. I guess if I was like Prince Philip at 99, I'd still be banging on about things like I've been talking about. So that's not going to go away. I might, but you know, my spirit will remain uh, as interested as it, as it ever was in the business, I guess. Well, so Tim, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. I'm not surprised. Um, I, I, I'm just uh, that, that uh, infectious enthusiasm rubs off. So uh, thank you very much for your time today, uh, Sir Tim Clark, President of Emirates. Wish you well and continued success in steering Emirates in the right direction and indeed keeping interest whenever that moment does come that you officially hand over the baton to someone else. So thank you very much, Sir Tim. John, you're welcome. You're welcome. Right. And See ladies and too. gentlemen, hope you've enjoyed our chat and uh, keep on watching uh, ATM Virtual this year. See you again for the next session.